Pursuit of Growth show, where we hold candid conversations with fascinating individuals from all walks of life to learn about their passions, successes, failures, lessons learned, and how they apply personal growth to their lives. We'll end the conversation with key takeaways that we can all implement to better ourselves and the lives of those around us. As always, I'm joined by my good buddy and co-host, Sammy Gonzalez. Sammy, what's up, dude? Greg, I'm excited. As I say, every time we do these shows, I'm super excited to have this show, not only because I have someone who is very inspirational to me, but they're a mentor to me. They're a friend to me. They're someone that I've leaned on for a lot of advice throughout the years. And that good buddy is Steve Gray. And I want to introduce him now. Steve is a, the co-owner and partner of the B2B branding powerhouse Spire Agency. He oversees the agency's day-to-day operations and helps to guide the agency's overall strategic direction. Steve is a results-driven leader who brings his deep marketing and operational expertise to lead the Spire team in providing strategically integrated branding, marketing, and creative services to his diversified base of clients, helping them to elevate their brands. He is a graduate of the University of North Texas with a BBA in strategic management and marketing. He's also a tried and true storm chaser with his story being featured in D Magazine's D CEO Magazine. Don't think we're not going to get into that here soon. (laughs) When he's not helming the Spire team, Steve can be found at the helm of his 36-foot Catalina sailboat he shares with Spire co-owner and his wife, Kimberly Tyner, spending time with his two children and new baby granddaughter, or off exploring the world and frequently ending up in Las Vegas. I am super pumped to announce that Steve has joined us on the uh, TPG show today. Steve, welcome aboard. That is a hell of an introduction. (laughs) Thank you, Sammy. I especially appreciate what you said at the beginning, and I promise when we do this for round two, I will make the uh, the bio part that you're reading much shorter. (laughs) Everybody always says that whenever we go into the bio, they're like, wow, that is a long bio, but I think that it really encompasses who you are. I I appreciate you providing uh, lots of details to us because we want to dig into it all. Um, you know, we know we're very appreciative that you're a fan of the show. We know you've watched many episodes. Um, and the fact that you like you were prepared for this well, it just makes us happy. I think that's what we're all about here at, at the Pacific Growth. <laughs> well, we'll decide at the end of the show how prepared I was. But I am uh, thrilled to be here and excited to, to talk with you guys. Well, as always, we like to take that very first intro and throw you that softball. And that softball first question is, if somebody made a movie about your life, who would you pick to play you and what story would you want them to tell? Um, this was actually a family conversation um, just last week over, over Thanksgiving. We, you know, you have those games where you play and you have the giant box of cards and there's 500 questions and you pull one out and ask and everything. And there was a, a question very similar to that. Um, and as much as I would like to say Matt Damon, um, I just, uh, I, I don't know that I would put him through that. Um, but I am a, um, it's going to sound funny. I'm actually a huge fan of, um, of the Karate Kid and Cobra Kai and uh, William Zabka, who plays yeah, yeah. Johnny Lawrence. Back in the day, um, 30 years and, and 50 pounds ago, um, I was told that, uh, that we had a resemblance to each other, uh, Steve Gray and Johnny Lawrence, at least. Um, and, uh, and I, I think it would be, I, that'd be fun if he played me. Um, I think it would be interesting. And actually, I think um, there's some similarities between the, uh, the Johnny Lawrence character in my life. I think you, <laughs> you, know, you have a, uh, you know, a good-hearted guy who wears his heart on his sleeve, um, oftentimes maybe a little too transparently, um, has good intentions, but, um, but like all of us, is a... Uh, is a, uh, a flawed character that uh, that makes mistakes and, and tries to uh, tries to be better and, and be a better human after doing that. So um, I think it'd be a fun story. I'd, I'm gonna have to give him a call and see if he'd be up for the up for the role. It would certainly be an independent, low budget film. Well, the, the question is: Are you Team Cobra Kai all the way? A hundred percent. There's actually, a, you guys may have seen this. It was a, it was a really popular YouTube movie uh, or YouTube uh, video six or seven years ago and it came out and it talked about, it took the entire Karate Kid plot and reoriented it where Daniel 
was the bad guy, which he is. And, uh, and Johnny Lawrence was just, you know, it was just kind of bad positioning for his part, but he was actually should have been the hero of the movie. Did you guys ever, have you guys seen that on YouTube? It's funny you mentioned that, Steve, because I was going to ask you that because I have seen it and it does <laughs> such a good job that when you watch the Karate Kid now, I can't turn that off. And so I see the entire movie in a different lens and you really do see how in many cases, Danielson was manipulating things. He was provoking what? things. He was doing a lot to cause the issues that he was experiencing. And, uh, you know, I got a soft side for Johnny, uh, Johnny Lawrence. And of course, if given the chance, you got to sweep the leg all the time. Sweep the leg. He had a great thing going until Daniel moved to town. You yeah, know, right. he was the defending, the defending all Valley champion. He had the girl. Mm -hmm. It was, it was perfect. It was, um, you know, just that move from New Jersey for Daniel just kind of turned his whole life into a spiral going forward. Well, I'll also state one other takeaway from that movie, and this kind of goes against our love for Cobra Kai, but I think <laughs> one of the, one of the all-time great moments in cinema history is at the very end of Karate Kid 1, Danielson's doing the, the crane kick, and the camera pans over to Mr. Miyagi, and he just looks at the camera, and he just goes, and just nods his head. And I was like, that's the <laughs> whatever. And then, of course, he executes the crane kick, the movie ends, it's you know the rest is history and johnny's yeah. life oh. is ruined forever yeah right absolutely only if pat morita was still with us to this day it could be in the relaunch on oh, youtube that would be good it would be it'd be awesome but i'm excited for season three to come out um and and to be candid and to pull the curtain back i actually dressed up as uh as johnny lawrence for halloween two years ago nice well i actually have a cobra kai t-shirt that i'm very tempted to run into my room right now and go put on Oh, good for, for you. Of, okay. For the rest of this interview. So we'll see if I can find a break. I might run in there and go grab yeah. it. See, we've, we're already planning the next the next uh, iteration of the show for us. <laughs> we're going to do it in full Cobra Kai gear. <laughs> yes. And full it. transparency, before we get rolling, I once dressed as a karate kid, and I was about 100 pounds heavier, so I looked more like Beverly Hills Ninja <laughs> than anything else. So, uh, for those of you who don't know that reference, that's Chris Farley in a karate gi. Yeah, it didn't turn out that well. <laughs> I love that. Well, well, we'll definitely need a picture of that for the next for the next show. I'll burned. I burned them all. <laughs> Good for you. Well, Steve, one of the reasons why we wanted to start with that question is because mm -hmm. I think as the audience is going to learn through the course of this conversation, you're an individual that a movie very, very, very well could be made of you. I mean, you're, what you've accomplished, what you do, how you live your life. But one of the things Sammy and I wanted to jump into kind of as our first bucket of conversation was, was about your business. And uh, Sammy has been sharing um, uh, about your agency with me for many years now. I had the opportunity to do a little research before this show. You won so many awards, it's incredible. And we, we thought we'd talk to you a little bit about kind of what's the difference between kind of what your firm does and what, what a marketing firm does. What, what does your agency really do? Help our audience kind of understand your purpose and your mission. Yeah, um, that's an excellent question. So we are actually, we're more of a branding agency uh, than a marketing agency. And when you think about the two and compare them to each other, a, a branding agency really kind of exists more upstream from marketing. Uh, we are focused on building a brand, building the personality, building the image, building the, uh, the content of um, what a brand is going to look like and say to share their purpose and their product with the world and getting that in place before you actually start taking the brand to market. Um, typically, we work exclusively with B2B organizations. Uh, that was a shift that we made in, the, um, in our business model six years ago. Um, but a lot of our focus really is more on building the race car rather than taking it immediately out on the racetrack. You know, you want to have a good brand built mm -hmm. before you're out, you know, dumping a ton of money in marketing, trying to take a bad brand to market. And, uh, that's what we exist. So, so you mentioned the awards that we've won. Um, we have an incredible, incredible team here at Spire and, and really all of the awards that we've won are due to their talents and the work that they've put in. Um, and it, it all really revolves around building brands and building images and building compelling content for companies so that when they do go to market, they're taking a differentiated message out there that's going to to distinguish them from their competitors and, and really build, you know, um, loyalty with their audience that they're they're evangelizing their message to what, what prompted the business to business 
change in your business model going from B2C to B2B? Back in um, 2014, we, um, our, our agency was actually much, much smaller back then. And we were trying to find a way to differentiate ourselves. There was a, uh, an author that we we're reading that's, that's uh, really famous in, in agency circles in terms of writing books about differentiating your brand. And we were looking at our organization and trying to figure out how can we position ourselves differently relative to the 150 other agencies um, in Dallas. And as we were researching our competitors, we were looking at their websites and almost without exception, every single website for every other agency in town started with the phrase, we are a full service agency that blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. And in essence, to me, as I read that, and I, I look at somebody that says we're a full service agency, it almost, it almost communicates to me, uh, you know, a business that's saying, no matter what you want, no matter what you need, no matter who you are, we can do something to help you. Um, and, and in a lot of ways, it's kind of like being the, you know, the general practitioner doctor. Mm -hmm. um, we decided the easiest and quickest and most effective way to differentiate ourselves is to come immediately immediately out and say we're not a full service agency. We don't perform and provide every marketing service in town, and we don't work for every single company that comes and knocks on our door. We are passionate about B two B. At the time, our portfolio was eighty five percent B two B, and our strongest clients were all B two B clients as well. And it was a natural fit for us to break the mold of not being just another full service agency that does everything for everybody in town, regardless of, of who you are, what your need is, et cetera. But instead to, um, you know, not be a general practitioner, but be, you know, be the heart surgeon, be the brain specialist, be the, the podiatrist, you know, somebody who has a very specific niche and focus. Um, and so we, we embrace the B2B perspective that way um b2b branding and marketing is very different than b2c branding and marketing and i think it's tough for uh agencies to do both of those very very well unless they're very large agencies that have um large teams to deploy on both sides and so we uh we chose our spot and it's b2b um took a couple of years to uh to get traction with that um but fast forward seven years and it, it's probably one of the better decisions that we've ever made for our agency in terms of our growth and our development going forward and actually, you know, now in, in 2021, about to be 2022, there's close to a double digit number of agencies in Dallas that all kind of um, have um, seized that B2B mantle in addition to us. So a question that I know the audience will ask as well is, yeah. what was that book? What, you know, what was one of the books that kind of went down the path? <laughs> yeah. Um, the, the author is uh, is Tim Williams, and he uh, originally came out with a book called Positioning for Professionals, and it's specifically written for professional services organizations, and, and it's written from a context of, you know, how do you go beyond the, you know, we're excellent because our, our customer service is great and we've got the best people in our responsive time, you know, how do you, how do you push yourself beyond table stakes and, and just saying the same thing that everybody else is and really distinguish yourself and differentiate yourself. Um, and so the, the book positioning for, for professionals was the, uh, was the first one we read. And then he had a follow-up book to that. Uh, I think he published three or four years later called take a stand for your brand. Um, but, but it, it's really, it's really about building good brands and not taking bad brands to the market. Um, we like to think of ourselves at, um, that Spire is kind of um, enemies of, of, we are the enemies of bad brand design and bad brand planning. And um, we, uh, we are also the enemies of good enough. We, uh, we firmly believe that um, good enough sucks. And what you need to do is, is uh, put just as much effort into your final, your final um, uh, uh, strives to get across the finish line as you do in the, uh, the first few steps of the race. You are really speaking our language, like as I, as I knew you would, because you know that's the pursuit of growth itself is all about that, right? We're we're all about improving, about aspiring to achieve goals and to work towards that. And so that that phrase that you just mentioned right there, like pushing towards the finish line, you know, just all of that like really resonates with us in the way that we've come along in our journeys, our personal journeys, and then also with the way that we're able to help other people along the way too and i so i think that's inspiring and, and the work that you've done 
is getting accolades as, as well as they should because the work you've done is, is amazing. Um, and I, I salute that as I just saw that you won another award. Um, I think it was like published today. I think this morning I saw it. So uh, kudos again Thank to you. you and the team. I appreciate that. Yeah, our, our creative team, you're, you're talking about a, an annual report that we that we published for a client um, earlier this year. And, and what they wanted to do was really kind of kind of capture the essence of what going through 2020 was like through the eyes of their business and through the eyes of their customers. And so we were able to um, uh, to do that with some some really killer design and photography. Um, our creative team is was just awesome on that. You know, you mentioned that because I know that 20, you know, the impact on businesses in 2020, you know, COVID being there. I mean, the reason why we're sitting on Zoom right now is because we had to pivot from a podcast um, over to a Zoom recording so that we continue with this show. Um, and we're looking to move back into face-to-face -face, um, shows here very soon. But, you know, every business had to pivot because of COVID. It was a worldwide impact. Talk a little bit maybe about the impact about the industry, you know, COVID's impact on the industry, but then also on your business and what were some of those things you had to do in those learning moments? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll first of all say I was, I was hopeful that uh, that we would be back to face-to-face -to -face by the time that we did this, but uh, but hopefully I'm your last Zoom podcast. And then uh, when we do this again, we can all sit around the same table together and, and mm -hmm. maybe have a, have a, a couple of uh, beverages of our choice with us uh, I for think the conversation. 100%. I think we just lined you up uh, for some time early next year. Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. I'm looking forward to that. Um, yeah, I um, kind of more seriously getting back to the impact of 2020. It was a, um, honestly, it was a terrible year for our industry. Um, marketing and branding are, are typically looked at as overhead expenses in organizations. And so when organizations are struggling, um, whether they are B2C organizations, consumer products, restaurants especially, um, and even B2B to an extent, one of the first expenses that those companies would, would cut is their, their marketing efforts and their branding efforts. And so um, a number of agencies across the country and, and here in Dallas were hit extremely hard um, by that. As a, um, as a B2B agency, we were not un, untouched, um, especially within the first eight weeks of, of COVID. We, we, had a, um, we had a dip um, that we were expecting, but uh, it wasn't pleasant. But fortunately, we were able to bounce back from it uh, faster than other agencies were. Um, we, we had a very good year last year, but we, we intentionally um, try not to beat our chest too much about the, um, you know, the success and the growth of the agency going forward because so many other agencies struggled uh, through the year last year. I think one of the reasons we didn't, honestly, um, what was simply going back to the fact that we're, we're a B2B focused organization. I would like to say that there's some type of, you know, executive insight and wisdom that, that Kimberly and I brought to the crisis and to the, to the problem to help navigate us through that, that other agency owners didn't. But in reality, we simply weren't an agency that had a, a big client base invested in restaurants and hospitality and, and entertainment, but instead we were focused with a client base that is constantly planning for two years, three years down the road and, and their success and failure isn't necessarily driven by their daily results of, you know, how many cans of Dr. Pepper did we sell last week? How many people did we bring in our door, but instead focused on, you know, how many railroad cars do we need to sell in 2022 to be successful? And what do we need to start doing right now, 14 months in advance to plan for that? So when a pandemic hits or when a, you know, a, a health crisis strikes the country like it did, um, clients of the type that we have um, aren't in a position to slam on the brakes and shut off marketing and creative expenditures to the extent that um, some other vulnerable businesses were. So um, it was tough on our business. We ended up having a good year in, in 2020. We were having a good year this year, but um, we also are um, cognizant of the fact that, um, that we were lucky um, in, in a lot of ways simply because of where we've chosen to build our business. You know, a lot of companies that have had this type of success that you have um, we'll tend to fall back and say one of the key ingredients to our success is our culture. 
And mm-hmm. it's a question that I love to ask business leaders because I think for a lot of people, when they hear the word culture, they think, oh, they've got a ping pong table in the break room. They do happy <laughs> hours together. And I think for people that do culture really well, they realize that it's so much more than that. And it's really the habits, the routine, and really the accountability piece of what makes an organization tick. I'd love for you to share a little bit about what the culture's like at Spire and, and kind of what you do and your wife to kind of help to lead that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, first of all, I would say at Spire, we're a team and not a family. Um, and I think that there's an important distinction there. Um, teams have a responsibility and an obligation to others to to manage their own um, the, the, the uh, task and the responsibilities that they have in order to get a job done. Um, teams are more likely to hold people accountable for doing excellent work um, and and hold people um, to a standard and and speak to them when they don't. Um, Families tend to be a little bit more more forgiving, um, a little bit more lax with that. And so I've noticed a trend in in over the course of the last couple of years where some companies start referring to their culture as a family. And I think that Mm -hmm. that's a mistake because I think that a lot of times when you get too familial in a business setting that the, the quality of your product false and that um, a lot of times it, it, it causes morale issues um, just like just like real families um, so that's that's one one element of culture that we that we try to implement um, another is a uh, is an important policy that we've we've had at spire for a very long time and this goes for our team members and for our clients and that is we have a strict no asshole policy at spire um, we, uh, we, we look for collaborators, we look for positive people, we look for team players and individuals that are going to support, um, support their teammates and support their coworkers, because this is a tough demanding job. And it, um, you know, we have long days up here. We have awesome days up here. There's a, there's a ton of laughter in the office. There's a ton of camaraderie. And if you, if you bring an asshole into the mix, then it uh, it sometimes could bring the whole house of cards down. Now I will share with you that we've never had to enforce the no asshole policy on our uh, on our team side. Um, I, we've got awesome people here. Even the even the the Spire team members that we've had over the course of the last ten years that that may not be here for various reasons. Now we're all great people, um, but we've had to enforce the no asshole policy for clients a couple of times. Um, and I think that. I, it, it's just been a no-brainer for us. I mean, we actually had a fairly large client uh, a couple of years ago that 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 we fired, and it was a, it was an impact for our revenue at the time. But the wear and tear that this particular client was taking on our team members that were assigned to the account just could never be justified by the by the revenue and the profit that we were bringing in. And so we made the decision to cut that client loose in order to protect the morale and the um, the emotional well-being, for for lack of a better term, uh, with our team. So um, yes, we have the the ping pong tables and the happy hours and and all of that, and and, uh, and we enjoy it. We don't actually have a ping pong table here anymore. We had one six years ago, but uh, but I got crushed in ping pong all the time. So <laughs> as we moved offices, it wasn't high on my priority list to keep the ping pong table traveling along with us. So we do all of those things, but I, I think a lot of times the um, the culture that really has built our organization is not the, the the fun activities and the cool things that we do, but instead the uh, the respect and the feeling and the camaraderie and the values that we have as a um, as an organization that kind of functions as the foundation for that. And then yeah, we do I, a lot of fun things on top of that. Yeah, I, th- that answer just it, it makes me just so happy to hear that, and I especially love the no asshole policy. And I love the fact that you shared the story about having to fire a client. Mm -hmm. I can tell you that I worked for a company years ago that, again, one of our big policies was the client is always right. And as a result of that, you could just see just the morale of our office just always just getting hit and hit and hit and people feeling taken advantage of and feeling like there was nothing that they could do that the company would stand and have their back. They had to constantly kind of just take it from very demanding clients. And when I moved to a different organization where they had a little bit different approach, it just felt like you had so much more opportunity, so much more freedom and so much more ability to really be able to shape the the course of the work that you're doing. And I feel like a lot of companies don't take that seriously, that sometimes you've got to let go of sometimes a very big client and it's going to be for the betterment of the firm in the long run. 
A hundred percent. We're always going to deal with with challenging clients. I mean, there, there's so many different personality types out there. But knowing that um, an organization is going to have your back when you're going through those tough days, I think mm-hmm. makes all the difference in the world. I mean, Greg, I would imagine when you made that switch, just the not only the, the, the improvement in morale for yourself, but just seeing kind of the different attitude that your new team members walked around with, just knowing that we're not going to just lay down and, and, and take it from a, you know, from a, a difficult client is um, made all the difference in the world for you. Yeah. And it's, it's also, uh, it, it's interesting how we've all been in situations where they're professional or, or even, even personally where there can be a group of 20 people and you have one person that brings in that toxic, toxic negativity. And it, right. it, it no matter how confident and leaders, you know, just leadership driven we are, it pulls everybody down the force of magnitude of one negative person can wipe out a whole organization. And so again, removing those type of people from your personal life and your professional life can have such a big impact. Now, we wanna love, care, support, encourage, teach and coach, but sometimes getting people away and saying, look, you're not the right fit for what we're doing. We wish you well, it's a hard thing to do, but it can be the best thing you do. 100%, 100%, positivity is a good thing. Um, mm-hmm. I will say that the uh, the client base that we have right now is probably the best set of clients that we've ever had in the history of the agency. Um, and, and, it, um, and, and that goes to our team as well. So um, it, it's just great to, to, to have that culture and to have the positive people around it to support it. You know, that really doesn't surprise me at all, knowing you and the way that your mind works and, and the way that it feeds into everything you do is being very strategic. And there's a lot of strategy that goes behind a lot of what you talk about, a lot about what you're doing. When we're talking about challenges, issues, or subjects, I always know that I'm, you're going to have that strategic lens that you put onto everything before you talk about it. Where does that come from? I know that you had that, that background in strategic, you know, in, in strategic management, which you mentioned in your, in your bio, but this, how did you lean more towards your focus on like operations and strategy in in that? Um, It's an interesting question. I've always been interested in operations and actually funny story. So so University of North Texas was a a great place to get a business degree Um, and and the the breadth and variety of courses, whether it was, you know, operation financials courses, you know, um, you name it, it was, it was top notch, but I backed my way into marketing. Um, and the reason is I could not stand accounting when I was 19 years old and up at UNT at the time. And I don't know if it's still that way now or not. Um, the only degree that you could get without t- having to take more than six hours of accounting was uh, was marketing with a strategic management minor, <laughs> and so and so it, it's strategy. Kind of, it's it's funny the right the, the 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 small decisions you make when you are a um, when you're a, a naive nineteen year old kind of how it uh, you know it changes the 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 course of your life after that. But uh, but really, um, I've always had an interest in in entrepreneurship. I've always had an interest in, in operations and in um, structuring companies and finding better ways to do things. I just happen to own or co-own um, a marketing agency now. Uh, so it's really kind of a similar skill set that, uh, that I think that I would apply um, regardless of the business that I'm in. And I love the business that I'm in, but, um, but I am in it because I couldn't stand accounting back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I love that story because, uh, you know, hey, there's some times where life is just going to give you that curveball. And uh, for me, math was never my strong suit. That's why I went into the creative endeavors as well. But I didn't start there either. You know, I, I, I wanted mm-hmm. to be a sports broadcaster on ESPN. I wanted to make the funny commercials um, that all the anchors were doing at the time. And that's ex- actually what led me to communications what led me to design what led me to advertising and all that where my degree was in graphic design communication design so do you remember sammy where the where the shift was where where the um the the track towards um sports journalism and sports communication um shifted for you over to design and marketing where you are you know kind of kind of your current career path yeah I, I, i absolutely do so i was 
you know, all my life, I mean, I have videos of me in diapers, like running around saying, I'm going to play for the Houston Oilers. I'm going to play for the Houston Astros. I'm going to You're uh, dating yourself on the Oilers. <laughs> <laughs> if the gray hair didn't do it, you know, um, but I was going to be this athlete, right? I, I was always just good enough to make the teams and I did okay in, in some sports, but I went to college saying I wanted to be on ESPN because I wanted to be in and around sports all the time. And again, it entertained me. It was something that I watched every single night before I went to bed. And I usually just laughed mostly at their, at their witty banter and their commercials. So I went into mass communication. And so I remember uh, somebody mentioning there is a group that is all the, I guess the sports communications group or whatever it was. Um, you should come out and check out the group. And I was like, sure, that that exactly the type of people I want to be around. Well, I show up and it was, it was so weird. It was like a carbon copy. Everybody was trying to be the people they saw. They were trying yep. to imitate everyone. So they were all using zingers. They were all dressed the same way. They were all literally the haircuts were the same way. And I did not fit in. I was just like, wow, this is this is not what I signed up for. Plus, I had curly hair and I couldn't like part my hair. Um, <laughs> so I went to my counselor and I said, you know, this is what I thought I wanted. But what is really the only time I ever went to the school counselor. But um, I said, I, I, this is not what I thought I wanted. Here's what I'm drawn to. Well, they said, well, have you ever thought about a career in advertising? And they said, that's where those commercials are from. That's where that's from. And, you know, I was like, no, I, I hadn't. So long story short, fast forward, you know, I went to some advertising classes, did that kind of stuff, and I liked it. But what drew me in was solving complex challenges by way of utilizing the science of communication design. So drafting, creating, and being able to tell a story without having to be there and tell the story um, through be it graphics or whatever it may be, or you know, something you create like a, like a show. Uh, was very intriguing to me. So my dad was a mechanic, my mom was a mechanic. So tinkering and building myself was always something that was kind of still to my nature. I really love to do. Um, and so that's kind of how that shift happened was right after that, that fateful meeting where everyone was wearing sport coats and talking really weird uh, to each other. That's awesome. So it was a very conscious decision for you. You, you figured out where all the, the smart, strategic, creative people were hanging out. You joined them. Yeah, right. Exactly. It was mostly, a, I don't want to do that. What else is over here? Uh -huh. and, uh, that's kind of how it happened. Yeah. Yep. I get it. Well, speaking of accounting, when I was in college, uh, I took an accounting class and, you know, the back of my mind was thinking, hey, I'll learn a little bit about this. I've, I've heard accountants have good careers and uh, I'm not mm -hmm. afraid to share that I failed my first open book accounting <laughs> test. And realized right there that, with you. Realized that that was not going to be my journey. And so I uh, decided to put that away and focus on having a little bit more fun in college and studying accounting books. And you never regretted it, right? Not once. Um, <laughs> well, one of the things that I definitely don't regret, and I think one of the things that I learned from college was how to have fun and how to start exploring new things. Steve, we've got to ask you, man, you've done so many cool things in your life. And I know we're not going to have enough time to touch all of them. But I mean, everything from you're a sailor, you're a triathlete, you travel, you're a, you're a poker player. And then like Sammy mentioned at the very beginning of the show, you're a storm, uh, storm chaser. So we want to start there and talk about one, how did you get started in storm chasing? And then we want to learn a little bit more about what you do and the experiences that you've witnessed. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I have been storm chasing for probably close to 20 years. Uh, at this point, and, and really kind of the, the genesis of it um, goes all the way back to, to when I was a kid. I, I grew up in, in Plano, Texas, and I was, when I was six, seven, eight years old, I was absolutely terrified of storms. Um, and as, as anybody who lives in North Texas or anywhere kind of in the Midwest knows, in the springtime, you can get some fairly hellacious storms that come through. And I vividly remember um, the house that we grew up in my entire family was over on one side of the house. That's where their bedrooms were. And then for whatever reason, my bedroom was over on the completely opposite side of the house. And, and some of those nights when the storm would come in, I would, you know, kind of um, crawl on my belly through the house to try to make it to my parents' room. Like I'm, you know, trying to dodge bullets flying over my head in a war or something like that. Um, and as I, as I got older, I, I kind of shed that fear a little bit and I became more fascinated with weather and I became fascinated with, um, with just the beauty of nature. Um, 
I am in in middle school when I would be playing football or playing outside with my friends. I was the kid that always at at 5 15 p.m. in the evening would would leave the game so I can go in and watch the weather report, you know, and <laughs> and, and and make sure that I understand what's going to be happening over the next 48 hours. Um, and so I got started in storm chasing. I I had a um I had just a a, a free weekend um you know many many years ago and I I had always wanted to to see a tornado um, and I had never seen a tornado and I knew that there was supposed to be a severe weather outbreak out in West Texas and um, I decided that a road trip was in order um, and to head out and see it and and I would say I I, I didn't go out as an uneducated person I I, I have a um, I have a fairly decent amateur level knowledge of weather patterns and kind of where to position yourself in storms so that you're not in danger. And um, I obviously would not ever want to see a tornado, you know, ripping through the middle of a city or, you know, going through downtown Dallas. But, but when you, when you have the opportunity to, to go out into the plains where there's literally no person and no structure and nothing, you know, within two or three miles anywhere around you and to see the, um, the majesty of a storm like that grazing across the plains, it, it's really unmatched. I, um, in some ways, I, I think it's as close as you can come to, you know, to, to stalking dinosaurs, you know, and imagining, yeah. you know, what it would have been like to see a giant, you know, T-Rex or a giant brontosaurus walking across the plains, um, you know, millions and millions and millions of years ago. Um, so I've always found it fascinating. And so there's a, um, I, I'm drawn to that, and I think I'm I'm drawn to that um, kind of as a nod to my childhood self that was that was terrified of it, um, and and I'm drawn to it just from a from a beauty perspective. And so, yeah. on an emotional level, that's why I storm chase. Um, on a functional level, I I storm chase because I recognize out on the plains and out far away from everybody the you know, that, um, you know, areas that are just populated by these little bitty teeny tiny towns, if something bad were to happen, uh, if somebody were to be injured, if a town were to be struck, there's really not a ton of first responders that are, that are, could easily get to, mm -hmm. to, to those locations. Um, you know, you're looking at towns that, uh, that have volunteer fire departments or oftentimes, you know, a, a county has a volunteer fire department because there's only, you know, 2,500 people living in this in this entire county. And, and fortunately, in all the years that I've chased, I've never been in a situation where I've had to deal with, um, with a lot of um, destruction or injuries or anything like that. But, uh, but I've always imagined and I know from, um, you know, from, from other people's experiences that when those moments happen, there is a need for quick thinking, resourceful people, not necessarily that can, you know, put a cast on a leg and put out a fire and everything single-handedly, but just somebody who can help manage a situation until the trained first responders are able to, to get to a spot. And so that's something that I've always wanted to be available to do. And then secondly, um, also on a practical level, See, I can talk for an hour alone about storm yes. chasing. So, um, but um, but oftentimes when you see tornado warnings, it'll they're they're radar indicated uh, tornado warnings, which means there's not a confirmation that there's a tornado actually on the ground. Um, those don't happen as often in populated areas because there's always somebody there to see it and to confirm yes, it exists or it doesn't exist, etc. Mm -hmm. um, but out in the middle of nowhere, you know, in the in western Oklahoma or up in the, the Texas Panhandle or eastern New Mexico, um, there might be a storm that looks like it could be a danger and it could be a danger to this town that's 15 miles to the east or 20 miles to the east, but they don't know if it's actually producing a tornado or not. And, and so having somebody out there that can actually put eyes on that storm snap a photo of a, of a tornado in progress, DM it over to the National Weather Service and say, you know, this is confirmed, this is where it is, this is the direction that it's heading in, this is the approximate speed that it's heading. It really helps to provide eyes on the ground to a, um, to a life risk that oftentimes, um, if nobody else were out there, would simply be a digital signature on a, on a computer screen. Can you so, walk us um, through, how, how do you decide where to go? Where, where, how soon do you know when something is developing, how does the process go from you maybe sitting on your couch to when you're in sure. your car 
heading towards that storm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there are a ton of resources um, that I follow um, just on the internet. And, and, and just like any weather forecast, you know, you know, days in advance, hey, there's going to be rain on Friday. We're expecting severe storms on Tuesday. But really, if you go to um, some of the maps, some of the detailed forecasts that are put out by the National Weather Service and the Storm Prediction Center, they get very, very granular in terms of this is a specific region where we think that the threat's going to exist. This is the the um, the scale that we think that the that the threat exists upon. So oftentimes, as far as four, five, six days out in advance, you can at least start kind of eyeballing a target. Um, and and then as as you get closer and closer to that target day, um, it may change. It may shift north. May shift shift south. Uh, it may increase in likelihood. It may decrease in likelihood. And and really, I. Um, I monitor going into that day simply where is it going to be? What is the what is the the um, the likelihood of it occurring to begin with? And then if it uh, if it looks like it's going to be a, a a high likelihood, and it looks like it's going to be out in the middle of nowhere and a, you know away from people and, and away from um, from populated cities, that would be the type of storm that I would go and I would target and I would go out to. Um, so that would take us to the day of. So there's your your preparation several days in advance. And so the day of arrives uh, and we're heading out and really technology's advanced so much in the last five years that I can I can storm chase with my with my phone. Um, I have um, really, really high power detailed um, weather radars that I'm able to bring directly into my phone with real time data that not only can, can tell me where a storm is, tell me of how a storm is developing, but also put a GPS dot on the map that, that tells me where I am and what my position is relative to that storm. Um, it, it, it's truly on a level that, that you would see, you know, on, on the news at 1015 at night and, and kind of having all of those different lenses and different filters to look through. And, um, you know, five years ago, I would head out and I would storm chase and I'd have to take a laptop and, you know, a million other things with me to, uh, to track it. But, uh, but at this point in time, um, I'm really able to, uh, to track storms and to report sightings to the National Weather Service with uh, nothing more than my, my cell phone. And so, candid question here, what did you think sure. about the movie Twister? Um, well, that movie is almost 25 years old. Uh, so we have to we have to put that in in context. I loved it at the time, and and you know, thinking back, um, Sammy, that probably that probably was somewhat influential in my uh, in my um, my hobby that I have today, and my my specific involvement in the in the hobby today. But I will say, um, it is a movie that I watch every few years, and and while some movies uh, you look at and say that held up. I don't know that Twister <laughs> held up quite so well. <laughs> yeah, but, but I, yeah. <laughs> I seem to remember, um, gosh, and I, I, I don't know this for sure, but I think they might be doing a remake. I seem to recall oh. a couple of months ago, maybe seeing that that was in, in plan or in production or something like that. So um, great actors in Twister, though. So um, there were some pretty legendary characters in there. I was going to say, there, awesome there, there's lights. several Academy <laughs> Award winners, actually, that are in that movie. Absolutely. Surprising. Yeah. Yeah, Bill Paxton, um, Helen Hunt, Philip Seymour Hoffman, Philip Seymour Hoffman um, yeah. who played an incredible character. So um, I'm going to revise. That movie has definitely held up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so probably not in my probably not in my top ten, but definitely in my top twenty movies of all time. Steve, uh, I'd be interested in knowing: Do you have like a, a favorite moment, or maybe not a favorite, but when, when someone's asking you about your experiences? Is there a story that just has really just stayed with you over time that you've experienced storm chasing? Yes, um, there is. Um, I had the opportunity, and this was 10 years ago now. Um, my daughter was 15 years old. She had her learner's permit. And so, you know, when you're, when you're going through that year, you know, when you're 15, you've got your permit. Before you can get your driver's license, you need to, um, you know, you need to spend... 20 hours or 30 hours behind the wheel with a licensed driver. Um, and by the way, the story is not turning into my daughter was driving while we were storm chasing. So, okay. um, but, uh, <laughs> but we did have an opportunity one weekend to, to go up to Oklahoma uh, together. And the intent was really um, for her to get some time driving behind the wheel. She was brand new to driving and, and it just happens that it was in the springtime and we knew that there were going to be some storms potentially that afternoon. And so, we had a uh, father-daughter weekend 
uh, where we went up to Oklahoma and we spent the mornings, you know, out in the middle of nowhere uh, with her driving behind the wheel, just kind of getting comfortable driving the car, et cetera. And then when the late afternoon arrived, um, I took over and some storms did pop up. We went and um, I took her storm chasing with me, recognizing that we were going to be in a rural area and we were going to keep a safe distance from us in the storms. And um, we saw seven tornadoes uh, that afternoon, including uh, the first one that she ever saw, which was actually a, a double or two tornadoes at the same time that were separated by about 300 yards. And so um, that was an experience that I'm never going to forget um, with her. And, and um, uh, I have some some great pictures that uh, that we took of, of each other while the tornadoes were on the ground. And and um, it was just really special. It was uh, it was special to um, to see that. Um, that force of nature, um, you know, about a mile away, um, you know, just kind of, again, just kind of grazing through a field, not, not destroying anything. Um, and for her and I to be standing on a road um, at a safe distance and, and watched it moving across and to be able to hear the wind and for it just to be the two of us out there, there really wasn't anybody else around uh, whatsoever. And it was just kind of the two of us and, and watching this, um, this, this uh, force of nature out there. And it was a, uh, it was a really special moment for us. And, and, um, and I felt really lucky because um, um, there's some people who have taken storm chasing with me and we've never seen anything. And they've you know been in the car with me for six or seven or eight hours. And so uh, to take her out in the very first time to see that, that's uh, tough to top. So that's probably my, my top memory ever storm chasing. That's amazing. I, it's, you know, it's one of those things that as you look to the heavens, right. And you see the storms developing, you, can often sit back and picture and, and, and wonder why, how, you know, all that kind of stuff too. But to see that type of power, to see that mythical creature, almost like you mentioned, let's see a dinosaur roaming a plane, right? Been around before us, will be a, around long after us, right? That's Absolutely. An amazing, amazing experience. And, you know, I think we might have to take this show on the road one day and, and experience this with you one day. <laughs> Maybe that's the next right. episode. We're only we're only five months away from it, so I, I'd love yeah. to do that. that would yeah. be... <laughs> well, the podcast know, we... while uh, while driving eighty miles an hour down I twenty <laughs> west yeah. of Abilene. <laughs> as long as you're driving, that's fine with me. Yeah, I'm good with that. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, um, I want to talk a little bit more. You know, something that's very important to to Greg and myself, and we and we intentionally put this into the pursuit of growth it are those hobbies and experiences and sometimes people see that as like oh you don't want to just but you know oh we just want to have fun all the time right we are all about pursuing life and the joy of life as well and hobbies and experiences play a lot into that we've talked about storm chasing too but again you're a man of, of many many hobbies and experiences that i think all really co-mingle together like if you look at the thread behind them they're all very strategic in nature and this does not surprise me but i want to talk a little bit about your love for sailing i know it's something that that's new to you um we mentioned your your uh 36 foot was it catalina Yes. Yes, catalina mm -hmm. sailboat. 36 foot I, catalina sailboat. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe talk us a little bit about Number one, how did that come about? Because that's not something that <laughs> most people in North Texas think about learning. Um, but then number two, like, just give us a little bit of insight as to uh, how that goal got started and and why you love it so much. Yeah, um, honestly, it was it was completely a um, a result of um, my wife Kimberly and I wanting to make sure that we continue to to appropriately balance our life between um, our work and our passions and having fun and being able to get away from work. And, and just kind of as the recap, as you read in my bio, um, Kimberly and I, in addition to being married, we, uh, we co-own and run Spire together. And so you can imagine when we're away from work, if we're not staying really busy, there's always going to be one topic of conversation that's going to come up and it's going to be, Hey, what's going on at Spire? Here's an issue we have at Spire, et cetera. And so the, the more um, hobbies and pursuits and activities that we have together away from work kind of helps us to, to not get burnt out on the, you know, the daily process of owning and running the agency, um, which brings us to sailing. Um, we wanted to find a hobby and a pursuit um, 
that we could do together. And we wanted to, to pick something out that neither one of us had any experience in whatsoever. And this was actually only three years ago. Uh, and so as we, um, you know, as we kind of went down the, the short list of, of what that can be, um, you know, we, we quickly um, kicked uh, horseback riding to the curb and, and uh, race car driving and, and everything else. But sailing made a lot of sense on, on so many different levels. We, um, we love the beach. We love the ocean. We love being out on the water. Um, I think at the time we were we were kind of following a couple of YouTubers that were that were sailors, and so every Sunday they would post their, you know, their their video for the week and kind of show us what their life was like. And so we decided to get into it. Um, we uh, took some classes, uh, kind of some basic level classes here in Dallas, out at Lake Ray Hubbard, and then we were really interested in catamarans, and so we went out to Fort Lauderdale for two weeks over New Year's back uh, a couple of years ago, and spent a couple of weeks on a um, on a thirty eight foot catamaran. Um, at the time, with the intention of possibly buying a boat and keeping it down in Florida, um, we we came back to Dallas, and and uh, we realized that. Um, as much as we like the idea of um, of going down to Florida and sailing all the time, we we have some professional obligations here that uh, <laughs> that may may preclude that that ever becoming a reality, at least in the next few years. And so we we bought the boat um, here in in Dallas. We we actually found it up on Lake Texoma, and then uh, we moved it down to uh, to Lake Ray Hubbard so we could be closer to it. So you know, kind of on those summer nights when it doesn't get dark until nine fifteen or nine twenty at night. We can cut out of the office at 5.30 or 6 o'clock and be out at the lake in 20 minutes and, and be on the boat and be sailing. That's the, that's the picture. That's kind of the, you know, the, uh, the utopia of, of why we did what we did. The reality is very different. Um, the, uh, the boat has pretty much sat out on Lake Ray Hubbard for the, for the better part of the last year. In, uh, in March of this year, the marina where we keep the boat, um, where we store the boat, was destroyed in a freak windstorm. Mm -hmm. You know, nod back to storm chasing, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and while our boat was largely undamaged, it has been completely inaccessible for yeah. the last eight months. And um, and so we get to uh, we get to drive over the bridge at Lake Ray Hubbard and look out at the uh, the marina as it's being rebuilt and, and see our sailboat there and, and wave to it, but. Uh, we haven't sailed in, in many months, and, and so I feel like we're going to have to learn how to do it all over again. Sailing's not easy, <laughs> especially, uh, I, I think maybe it's like skiing, you know, um, you know, six and seven and eight-year-old kids, when, you, when they pick up skiing, you know, they're going down blacks and blues, you know, by the end of the second day. But when a 40-year-old picks up skiing, they're, they're on greens for three weeks, and I think probably sailing's the same way. I think Kimberly and I have been on greens for, for uh, quite some time. We, we never really got good at it. Um, and, and honestly, I think we kind of, um, we kind of, um, outran our coverage on the boat that we bought the, uh, 36 foot Catalina sailboat somewhat turned into a, uh, a little bit of a bumper boat, uh, getting it in and out of the slip at the marina. <laughs> and, and so we were, we were just getting good at not crashing into the other boats. And the, uh, and, and then we, um, we had this happen. So we have to, we have to start from square one again, but, um, hopefully they're saying by February, we'll be back out again. By the way, the deck of a sailboat would be another excellent place for a podcast episode. Ooh. Well, uh, <laughs> taking that note, just throwing it out there, <laughs> Steve. I'm I'm going to attempt to make you extremely jealous right now. So last weekend, I was actually in Florida um, oh, visiting wow. my girlfriend's parents, who they live in Perdido Key, right outside of Pensacola, and they had just purchased their sailboat. Now they, very similar wow. to you, they started on Texoma, then were at Ray Hubbard, they moved to Florida, I may be wrong, two or three years ago, um, and then that finally had gotten their sailboat that they really wanted and kind of had their eye on there for Florida. And so for the first time ever, I've grown up on a lake and been on a ski boat my whole life, but I've never been sailing. And I actually got to go out into the sound, into the ocean and actually sail. And I can see where the adrenaline, the addiction, but you named you nailed it. It's hard. Like it's a lot of work, and there's a lot of learning that goes into it. That's an amazing Thanksgiving to be able to be able to go out and do that. Well, um, it, gets, it gets better. So I told okay. them that I'd never seen in my entire life. I've never seen dolphins in the wild, 
And so I made them mm-hmm. promise me that we'd run with some dolphins. <laughs> so I kid it's you not, <laughs> I kid you not, as we're sailing, we look into the distance and sure enough, they're like, look over there, there's a, there's a, you know, four or five and you could see their fins and every now and then you'd see them kind of come up and down. And I was just, I'm so happy, right? Well, fast forward five minutes, those five dolphins spent the next 20 minutes riding right oh, beside that's us. that's awesome. So I've got videos up close. I literally am leaning over. I can reach over and pet them. They're that close. Yeah, so there, there's a picture of me <laughs> with the dolphin. That's incredible. Uh, on Instagram. So one of the coolest yeah, experiences yeah. of my entire life is just being able to see those dolphins in the wild. So, Steve, I get your, wow. your love for sailing. And you know what? Beginner, expert, doesn't matter. When you're out of the water, it's all good. There is nothing better than that. And, and the fact that you, you got to do that in, you know, relatively a serene setting when just a, a few of you around as opposed to, you know, being out on a tour boat with 200 people and everybody yelling and screaming. I mean, there's, there's, um, there's an element of peace and majesty when you see a, when you see a creature like that and they, they come up so close to your, to your boat. And um, I mean, I, I can't think of a, uh, a better experience, especially for your first time out on a sailboat, uh, than yeah, to, to be able to do that. <laughs> so, so here's my question for you, um, Greg. Now that uh, now that you've been out on a sailboat, most people typically have to declare, "I've been on a sailboat. I've been out on a ski boat." It's kind of like uh, Cobra Kai and Miyagi, though. You have to declare: <laughs> Are you a sailboat guy or are you a ski boat guy? You've experienced both. Which which are you going back to? Yeah, well, my, my experience with the sailboat is minimal, I'll, I'll admit. But uh, as of today, I'm still a ski boat guy because I'm built for speed and power. <laughs> I like to go fast. And, uh, you know, obviously sailboats can get moving. But for the most part, you know, it's a, it's a long time to go just a short amount of space. So uh, while I love the experience and I would do it again in a heartbeat, and I'm very interested in learning more about actually being able to pull a little bit more weight while I'm on the actual boat, um, for me, I like to just get behind that steering wheel and just put the put the throttle down and just cruise. I get it. I get it. Well, I am very jealous of that story. Um, but I, I, would, uh, <laughs> I would look forward to the opportunity to have you out on, on Ray Hubbard and we'll uh, we'll see what we can do on the sailboat and, and kind of work it a little bit. I can't promise dolphins, but uh, but I know that there's some very large catfish in Lake Ray Hubbard, so cat- maybe we can find a <laughs> Cat, cat, catfish are majestic creatures as well <laughs> in their own way in their own <laughs> right way. oh man steve and, you, hey, at least we, we can cook those up and fry them though that's the you got it you got it <laughs> all right so greg's promising us a fish dinner when we go yeah, sailing fish, with fish, him. fish fry uh, on the this ocean. is a there this is go. a done deal <laughs> <laughs> we've got a lot of action items that are coming out of this yeah, for sure yeah. the, the, the finest cuisine from from the uh the mouth of lake ray hubbard <laughs> the depths of the great lake ray hubbard <laughs> yes. yeah uh we want to touch on another thing too i know we're, we're running up against probably time for you and we again we appreciate you spending time with us and allowing us to to use part of your busy schedule um uh to learn more about you and your fascinating sure. life but you alluded to me, or actually you told to me one day in a, in a conversation that we had, and again, for the audience, you've been an incredible mentor, incredible friend of mine. Uh, you're, you're someone that I can, I can text on a, on a day's notice and get more info about certain topics, or you're someone that I can, uh, I can you know, you're a confidant. I can tell you about what's going on, and, and you can give me some real great feedback as you've shown that you're a very strategic-minded person. You you told me something when we were were meeting one time, and that was about your. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you're coming up on a major milestone um, in your life, right? You're, you're hitting a milestone, um, and so some well, of the things. Well, that, well, let me let me. Uh, I can pull the, the curtain back on that. Okay. I'm I'm about to wrap up my my first fifty years and begin my next fifty years. Is that so where we're going with this? That's where we're going with this. So there's two reasons why <laughs> okay. I wanted to bring that up because you mentioned that you were a grandfather and you say we can all we can all call you grandpa one time. Um, so I'm saving that one. Greg can use it whenever he wants to. But uh, so one congratulations on that. I know that that was an important, important part of your life and that you're really Absolutely. excited about that. Uh, but number two, you said you know you wanted some big plans um, for for your major milestone. So talk us talk to us a little bit about what that big ambitious goal was how you set forth on that and how things are going with it 
Absolutely. I believe you were referring to me confiding in you that I was um, or am considering running an Ironman triathlon uh, yes. during my 50th. Wow. Yep. Um, I have been fascinated. Well, first of all, I've been a big fan of the sport of triathlon um, since I was 12 years old. Um, back in back in the day on Saturday afternoons, there was a show on ABC called Wide World of Sports, and, and they would um, always kind of focus on different sporting events every weekend. And and one of the things that uh, that always captivated me was watching the Ironman World Championships held every year in Kona, Hawaii, and, and the fact that, um, you know, people actually swam out into the ocean at seven o'clock in the morning to swim three miles and then bike a hundred plus miles after that. And then if that's not enough, once it's all finished, they go and they run a marathon. Um, a big deal. And so, yeah. <laughs> so, so it's always been a, a sport that I have followed um, kind of from the, from the fringe. Um, but over the course of the last five or six years, as I've kind of continued to get closer and closer to my 50th birthday um, and, and getting older, just the, um, the, the priority of, of continuing to be functionally fit um, has become increasingly important to me. And, um, and so I've, won, I've considered different ways that I can do that. And, and my mind just always kept going back to the sport of triathlon, the, the swimming, the biking, the running, the cardio, um, you know, the fact that, uh, that a lot of the, um, the elements that are involved in completing the race um, involve your, um, you know, extremely strong cardiovascular, but it's not necessarily like weightlifting where, you know, there's a, there's a tremendous amount of, of um, strain and impact and contact and stuff like that. People obviously get injured um, over training or racing all the time, but, um, but it was something that appealed to me. And so five years ago, I started, um, I started competing in shorter distance triathlons and, and primarily sprint triathlons. They're much easier to, to access their, they, they happen all the time here in North Texas, as opposed to longer distance triathlons, you kind of show up, run a race, you're finished in a couple of hours, you go home, but you can kind of keep training as part of your workout uh, routine during the course of, of the week. Um, but the Ironman idea has never strayed far from my mind. And so that is something that, uh, that I am, um, giving strong consideration to doing next year and, um, and potentially sometime mid next year around my birthday, I, I would love to be able to do it. Um, when you ask how the training is going, if I were to be candid with you, I would say not as well as I want, wanted it to, uh, so far the, uh, the, the thing about, um, when you're training for shorter distance triathlons, you, you can do that with four or five hours of training a week. When you're training for a longer distance, an Ironman distance triathlon, and I know you guys have actually had a uh, had a couple of folks on in, in past shows that, that have run these races, but it's a it is a time commitment. I mean, you're looking at um, you know 14 to 20 hours a week of of training time consistently, long weekends, etc. Um, being able to carve that time out has um, honestly been a bit of a challenge for me, uh, and I've also had a um, a recurring lower back issue that's been a little bit of a challenge for me over the course of the last two or three months. And so I'm a little behind on that goal right now, but I'm not, uh, I'm not giving up on it going, you know, so um, hoping maybe once we get on the other side of, uh, well, we're in December, so uh, the back's feeling pretty good. So we're going to get back on the horse. Nice. Of the, of the three activities, running, biking, mm -hmm. swimming, which one do you excel at? Which one is your biggest challenge? I am 100% a swimmer. Um, I'm, I'm, um, unfortunately in the, in the races I've run swimming is completed. It's generally a, just a 400 or 500 or 600 yard swim. Mm -hmm. So you can knock that out in about 10 minutes and then you get to move on to these sports that you, that you don't excel at so much. And that's what takes about an hour. Um, I'm a pretty big guy. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm six one, I weigh over 200 pounds. And so it's, it's tough for me to get my bike going as fast as these, um, you know, these, uh, these smaller, you know, five, seven, 145 pound guys that just have, you know, they're, they're much more aerodynamic <laughs> than, than I am. Uh, so, so I would love to enter a triathlon where the, um, the primary, uh, distance or time constraint or, or focus was on the swim and a little bit less on the bike and the run. Unfortunately, they don't make them that way. Uh, so I've, um, I've, I've come to, um, to feel good about all the people I pass on the swim and not to take it too personally when they fly past me on the bike and tell me what a great swim I had. <laughs> do, do you think that's just a, a purely a safety type thing to not have the swim as long as the run in the bike? 
Because I've always wondered that why yeah. it's so much shorter than the uh, the other two. It is a safety thing. Um, um, well, first of all, just the the longer the swim, as, as people get into kind of more of a cardiac or a, a cardio distress situation, it's it's tough to. It, it, you can't just pull over to the side of the road, um, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, or you can't just take a seat. So, so they they do limit the distance of the swim for the the safety of the athletes. Um, somebody actually had the terrible idea three or four years ago to to um, sponsor a race and have it run in reverse, um, where you start with the run and then you do the bike and you finish oh, with wow. the swim. And um, I don't think anybody drowned, but it was a complete disaster. Um, oh, you know, people were being, you know, so I, I'm not sure how that even got off the um, off the uh, brainstorming board to to become a reality. But um, it's smart to have a swim first when you're when you're fresh. Just yeah, yeah. Wow. Well, with all that, you know, you've got a lot of hobbies. You've got a lot of experiences that you've been through. You know, tying this back into the business side of things and, and that growth mm -hmm. and those lessons learned, what are some of the key tactics or maybe takeaways in which you are able to have that fulfilling life that's well rounded, be able to impact as many people as you do, and then also run a great business, have a great family, do all of these things that you do? Uh, because frankly, lots of people are trying to do a lot of things all the time and some people don't do them all that well. So are there any tactics or tools or, or ways that you kind of keep all things bundled together nice and neat? I will, um, I'll preface my answer by saying that um, I too am an individual that struggles with, uh, with biting off more than they can chew. And, and um, it, it's one of my areas for development. I, I oftentimes, um, have so many different things going at once that I that I struggle with um, with getting any one of them completed. I I, I think it speaks to my ADD <laughs> background that I've I've dealt with my entire life. I, I see something and I want to I want to dive into it. Um, but a, but a couple of the things that that I from a tactics perspective that I've tried to employ in my life is is setting up barriers first of all mm -hmm. between your um, your your business and your professional life and your personal life. Um, and that's been in, in especially important given the fact that I am married to my business partner. Uh, we have a we have a, a, a fairly strict rule that when we get home at night that um, Spire stays at the office. Um, and, and when we're home in the evening, we focus on ourselves and we focus on our relationship and we focus on our family and we focus on the kids and we focus on our hobbies and we leave work at work and we... <clears throat> leverage the the time that we're away from work to kind of recharge our batteries and to um to to get our mind off of the you know the demands and the stress and the the triumphs of the day that we that we had professionally um not everybody is married to their business partner uh mm -hmm. so um you know traditionally you can come home and you see your spouse and how was your day and they could tell you about it and you can tell them about that when we do that, we're we're telling each other stories that we already know we've been dealing mm -hmm. with all day long, and so we so so we're in a little bit of a unique situation, and so it's important, and and we've had since the very beginning of our relationship to to have that barrier in place to to have a, a clear line and a and a divide between uh, between work and between our home. Um, the other tactic I think, and, and this has been a um, I, I'm not always great at this, but it's practicing saying no. Um, and, and, and when people, um, you know, it's practicing saying no, not only to, to individuals when, when they're making requests, but it's also saying no to yourself and, it, and it's knowing your own limits and, it, and it's not, you know, it's not bringing um, additional demands and, and unnecessary demands um, into your life when your plate is already full. Um, we would all love to find a way to, uh, to create 30 hour days instead of 24 hour days, but it, but it's just not happening. There's only a certain amount of time in the day where we can be productive. And, and so really leverage those precious hours that you have each day to focus on what's truly important to you and what's truly critical to, to accomplish your goals and, and say no to the noise that would distract you from, from focusing on that. Hey, Sammy, I want to jump in and, and ask Steve kind of a follow-up question along the lines of, of the question that you asked. Um, in, in doing that, I'll let you ask our famous or infamous maybe question about the time capsule. Um, but just in terms of kind of, you know, tactics, tips, suggestions, advice, 
last week we, or I guess it was actually two weeks ago, excuse me, we had a guy named Christian uh, Lehinger on the show, really fascinating guy, and he works in the realm of mental health. And mental health is an issue in our society from a personal standpoint, from a business standpoint. You know, we're in an epidemic of people that are really struggling with mental health issues. For someone in your role as a leader of a company, I'd just be curious to know, how do you manage the pressure that you feel? How do you deal with anxiety and just the, the, the negative stress along with the, the positive stress that comes along with what you do? Can you share anything with our audience and kind of how you manage or, or deal with some of those things? Yeah, I can. Um, sometimes in, in, in the role that I'm in, it, it does, um, you know, I, you know, to be perfectly honest, there are, there are tough days and there's challenging days. Um, a business mentor of mine, um, who, um, who was the, uh, the grandfather of my kids, um, um, had a saying and, and he, he, um, he passed away five or six years ago, but he had a, he had a couple of, of sayings that always just struck with me, um, professionally. Um, and one of them was in business, things are not always as good as you think they are, but they're never as bad as you think they are. And, and from a, a mental health and a stress management perspective, um, I have really worked to train myself to not live and die every day on the successes or failures or current situation of a business issue that you're dealing with at that time, but to, to take the time to step back and to step away from it and reflect and, and realize that um, you're not going to, you know, whatever happened today isn't going to make or break you um, for the, you know, for the rest of your life or professionally, no matter how great it was or how bad it was. Um, it's, it's really easy to kind of overreact to things in the, in the heat of the moment and in the heat of the battle. We're, we're winning business. We're trying to grow clients. We're trying to retain clients or we lost this bid. Um, but it, it's, it's really just another day you know, in, in, in that situation that's going to come back and it's going to repeat itself time and time again. I've been in this business for almost 30 years now. And, and so there's not a lot um, that I haven't seen. But when I was younger, I would get really, really wrapped up in, in you know, did I win or did I lose today? And, and really, um, our lives and, you know, in our, our professional careers, it's, it's, a, it's a marathon. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's something that we're in for the long haul. And if you... Um, you know, if you get too wrapped up in, in trying to win every sprint and, um, you know, over celebrating or being over de dejected about it, you're just going to burn yourself out over time. And, and so it's just kind of stepping it back and reflecting and realizing that, um, you know, um, no matter how heated things seem at, at, in the moment, um, contextually, they're, they're never up here and they're never as bad as you think that they are. Um, I'll also share with you, though, Mental health is incredibly important uh, for us with, um, for Kimberly and I, uh, and, and we've kind of, it, I'm, I'm happy over the course of the last year, actually, that, it, that it's, it's become more of a topic that we can talk about in society. Um, and we are actually within the agency, I'm, I'm working on finalizing um, a, a new benefits uh, package that we're going to be rolling out next year. And we're actually going to have a program that's going to be focused on mental health, where, where individuals and team members have a resource that they can call um, if they need to talk to somebody, you know, or if, if they need to have a session or if they need to get something off of their chest. Because one of the, um, you know, I think one of the critical shortcomings of our society is that we've we've ignored mental health issues for too long. And, and a lot of people simply don't have the resources, don't have the accessibility to professionals that can get them help when they need it. And so that's something that I'm hoping to see more companies kind of, kind of adopt to bring on board and make available to their teams going forward also. You know, I, I've said many, many times, you know, we have a gym on every street corner. I'm like, we need to have a mental health facility. We, we, should, we should have memberships to places we go, we work that out because it's so important and we've just got to continue to alleviate the stigma that for many years kind of was associated with mental health because the reality is when you get this right, man, life is limitless. A hundred percent. And and the stigma is what's holding us back from it. You know, yeah. people need to be able to 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 stand up and, and to to say in a non-judgment environment that, you know, that I'm hurting or or I'm struggling with this. Um mm -hmm. I will um I mean, I'll do it right now. I'll share with you guys. I, I, I have struggled with, with, um, with moderate depression on and off for, um, for almost my entire life. Um, and, and at times over the course of the last 20 years, I, I have um, sought 
guidance and I've sought counseling and I've sought help for it. Um, haven't had to in, in quite some time, but, um, but I think it should be okay yeah. for, for anybody to be able to, to stand up and say that in a, in a judgment-free environment and, and, and have it not carry any more stigma than saying I had a cold last week you know, or, or I, you know, I, I was dealing with a, with a sprained ankle uh, last year. And, and I think until we can get to a point where, where we can freely talk about, you know, what's going on up here, as much as we can talk about what's going on with the rest of our body, I, I, I think that we've, we've still got more, more ground to cover. Yeah, my, my challenge has been anxiety. And a lot of people will, will, will hear that and they're surprised by it. And I've learned, the more I talk about it, the more it helps me. By being able to share that with other people, is it's like this lethargic, it's almost kind of a little bit of a therapy to be vulnerable and to be able to tell people like there are things that sometimes I can't even identify what's causing it. I've got to really drill down to some of the root issues and be like, oh, that's the trigger. And now that I've kind of learned what that trigger is, I can use the help of others and maybe some of the tools and tips that I've learned to be able to address it and overcome it. But yeah, that stigma of, of having to feel like I'm going to keep it inside when I was much younger was really, really a, a tough thing for me. Yeah. I totally get that, Greg. I, you, you've you've got to have an outlet to mm -hmm. to you've got to be able to let it out, um, and and feeling like that you you have to keep it bottled up or feeling like you need to keep it protected or secret or safe inside of you, all that does is um, is allow the the um, the issue or the the disease to to manifest and, and to grow. Um, mm -hmm. The uh, yeah, the, the way that you relieve it is to 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 be able to talk about it. You know, I like the fact that you pointed that out about the, you know, calling it a disease as well, because when we talk to Christian about it as well, he talks about the correlation directly from mental mindset to physical mindset or physical well-being, yeah. um, you know, and, and I, I made the, the statement that my family kind of runs in two different lanes, right? One side of the family had always kind of deteriorated from a, a heart attack, heart disease, you know, that kind yeah. of, of uh, well, I guess ailments and then the other side had kind of gone down from a from a mindset standpoint you know dementia and that kind of stuff leading to the de deterioration oh, wow. of the mind so I had a choice and and what I told him was I had a choice that I knew I could really impact the health and wellness side of things to get my 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 physical fitness in in check and all that he was like but you've probably actually done more for your mind than you think Mm -hmm. by getting that side of your your health in order as well mm -hmm. which i thought was illuminating i'd never thought of it that way so i was really appreciative appreciative that he mentioned it that way i i bet you're right about that our our, our medical technology has come so far in just the last 10 years i i can only imagine um what it's going to be like for 30 years from now and and, and i um i strongly believe you know our health and what you eat not only has a um uh, an impact of maintaining your your physical well being, but also also your mental well being. I don't think that the I don't think that the mental well being portion of that connection between you know what you consume and and how much you exercise has been drawn yet. But uh, but um, I think everybody kind of knows that it's there, and they just need to need to kind of you know directly tap into it. And I think that yeah. that's going to happen. Steve, I, I wrote a blog. It, gosh, it's probably been six or seven months ago about the uh, the gut microbiome. And just how influential yeah. that is to your brain and really how the two are just correlated. There's a, there's a nerve that runs from your stomach to your brain that literally has so many brain cells in it that aren't even in your brain. Mm -hmm. It's fascinating. And I'm definitely not the expert on it. I'm the guy that did the research, was fascinated by it, and wanted to share it with others. But so much of what you eat and your diet really does have an effect on your mindset, your mood, and just, you know, from what Sammy said, just your overall physical well-being. Yeah, I, I I think so. I mean, I, I can tell you from my from my own personal experience. I I um when I am eating well and when I'm focusing on eating healthy foods, I I um I obviously feel better, but I also think better uh, mm -hmm. during that time. And and unfortunately, um you know one of my areas for improvement is is I I tend to manifest my stress by by eating, and I I tend to. Uh, you know, on, on particularly stressful days, I um, I find myself mindlessly driving through through too many fast food restaurants <laughs> during the course of a week or something. And 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 when I do that, um, not only do I do I deteriorate physically and I feel slow and I feel lethargic, but you man, you just your your head just is not clear. I mean, it's it's almost like it's just a mm -hmm. direct 
connection to your brain and it, it, it clogs up the arteries in your heart and it, it clogs up your, you know, your thought process in your mind. And so that's something that I really, really push myself to do as well is, is just try to steer clear of, of stress eating those types of foods because um, all it's going to do is, is um, compound the issues that are probably stressing you out to begin with. Yeah, you know, one of our guests, and you know him as well, uh, uh, Dan Miller. Um, yeah, uh, you know he's a nutrition wellness expert as well as a man of many many talents and skills as well. But one of the things that he's always said is like, have you ever tried to stress eat a salad? Um, it's really <laughs> hard, um, <laughs> you know, or like to, yep. to eat ten pounds of carrots, right? That's it's very very difficult. Um, but you know that's just the running joke that he has. Like, I, and it always sticks with me. It's like. Cause I do the same thing. I can manifest mine by quickly running. I worked at home. So quickly running, you know, to the refrigerator, grabbing something and coming right back and just getting right back into it. Um, next thing you know, you've got a couple of different things that you're chowing down on as well. And, and physical fitness is, is one thing, mental, mental clarity. Um, and, and that kind of, the, well, I guess the mental clarity that comes along with being, um, stuck in a routine and guiding your routine with healthy habits, um, I think is really key and really important. And that's something I know that I work directly with my kids. Um, but I think a lot of people throughout this past year, they probably dealt with more than they, that they have in the previous years as well. Yeah, I think so. I, I, I think that, um, as we all went, went home in, in 2020, um, you had people who who took very different paths. You you had those that uh, that took advantage of the um, the time that they were saving every week by not commuting to the office and and um, you know and and having a little bit more flexibility in their daily work work routine and and they were able to channel that into being more fit or making positive lifestyle changes. Um, on the other hand, it, it actually took a terrible mental toll on on other folks. You know, when when you think about individuals that. Um, that um, are isolated or they live alone and, and perhaps their family lives in another city um 2020 was um was was really tough on them and and um and you know a lot of those people it was uh it was tough for them to get motivated enough to to find those positive life changes to make so um, um i struggled with that a little bit myself mm -hmm. so. I, yeah i think we all did and i appreciate you being and being open to sharing that with everyone because i think that the more and more we do these episodes, you know, there's all there's a lot of common threads that I've seen, and that's one the ability to find mentors and people that can help you along the way. Um, but then number two is the fact that we're all going through different types of challenges and struggles, no matter who you are and what you're going through. And so I appreciate that you're able to share that because I think people will find value in the fact that someone that's got you know a lot going on like you do and it's very very successful and, and again is a, a great. Uh, person that we can we can connect with uh, also has those same types of of challenges that they face and, and you're working through it yeah yeah i um i feel the same way i, I wasn't expecting the conversation to go in this direction but i'm, I'm really glad it, i'm glad we had a chance for the three of us to talk about this yeah, yeah. and i'm glad the audience is going to get to hear it as well because I, I think they're yeah. really going to appreciate your feedback as well Good. Well, Sammy, so. do you want to you want to throw out the infamous uh, time capsule question? Yeah, yeah. Let's let's see if we can make my way through it without messing it up like I typically do. But uh, so, all right. So, Steve, here's <laughs> here's one of those questions that that we put a lot of time and effort into thinking about. And it, and since you've seen the show, you kind of know where we're going with this. But everyone's heard that question. If you can go back ten years and give yourself some advice, what would you say? We're really not interested in that. We wanted to flip it on its head. So we are building the, the pursuit of growth time capsule. We want you to write a note to yourself, and put it in that time capsule, and we're going to bury it. And 10 years from now, we're going to open it up. What would that note say? Before I answer that, I'm curious, what is the, um, you did flip it on its head. Um, what is the origin of that idea? That's a great question. Um, <laughs> you know, because the hindsight, right? It's always easy. Um, I'll tell you where my origin came from. And then I guess I'll let Greg answer it with his, because I don't think we've ever kind of come to this conclusion together. Um, I love looking back and understanding what happened, but I am so interested in learning about what I can potentially do to impact the future. And so I like to, 
think strategically. I like to uh, put forth efforts and habits and, and things that I can do now to impact my day. So much so that it can be a little, it can give me a little bit of anxiety if I'm being honest about it. I will make three moves now to set up something a little bit later on in that fourth move. So for instance, funny little thing that I do when it's trash day at the house, I will on purposely make sure that I go in a specific order so that whenever I take the trash out, I can go put those trash cans back the same way because it's the most efficient route that I've found throughout the house in which I need to collect all of that trash. And I my love kids that. will tell you. You're <laughs> a man kid. after my own heart. <laughs> <laughs> my kids will tell you. They're just like, oh, dad, that's on the trash mission again. But I'm, I'm farming it out to them now. Um, so that's kind of where I, I, I wanted to see. Pick up from other people. What are you doing now that you want to remind yourself about mm -hmm. when you get to that 10 years down the road. So it's something you can store now. So thinking about what you're gonna tell yourself later, that's kind of where I came up with, with my part of it. I don't know, but what about you, Greg? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, for me, so, you know, the book that Sam and I wrote, um, you know, it's all about really working to become the best version of yourself. And that's gonna look a little bit different for all of us, but we should have goals that are the right type of goals based on the right areas of life and really kind of harmonious, right? And so part of that is living in the present but having a sharp eye to the future. And so I like this question and I think about myself, what would I tell myself? What would that note be for me? And several years ago, I sat down and said, you know what, I wanna define what's my life mission? Like, what am I really here to do? And I wanted to come up with a statement just like a company has. And now the statement's broad and, and encapsulates a lot, but then there's a lot of things that I do um, specifically to live up to the statement. And it's love God, serve people, share the gospel, and live the pursuit of growth. And so I could spend an hour talking about all the ways that I can go about doing that and how my goals and my lifestyle fit into that. And so for me, the thing that I would write in my time capsule was, have you lived your mission? And what are you doing now to push your mission forward? Excellent. Have you guys ever had an opportunity to, to turn the lens on yourself on your show and, and answer that question like you just did? First time. No. Nope. Good. Okay. <laughs> um, my, uh, what I would write up my time caps, capsule um, is the same now as it probably would have been two or three years ago. Um, so for me, my time capsule is going to get open when I'm um, on the, you know, mostly on the eve of my 60th birthday. And um and really, that's kind of another transitional time in, in you know, someone's life as they're kind of starting to look at the, um, you know, their, their professional career might be starting to wind down a little bit. And they're starting to, to kind of look at what they're going to do for, you know, in my instance, for the next 40 years of my life is I'm, I'm really committed. I, I, I want to um, I want to make it to 100 and I want to make it to 100 in, in really, really good shape with a with a with a good head on my shoulders. Um, I heard a, um, there was a study that was published, and I remember this to this day, um, I, I was listening to him talk about it on the radio when I was driving to work two or three years ago, and it was, for men especially, there is a direct correlation between how socially engaged they remain in their, um, in their older years and their life expectancy, mm -hmm. um, and, and typically um, men as they age, um, not so much for, for females, but, but, but really for men as they age, um, there is a tendency for them to, um, to, to get withdrawn and to, to shrink their, their social circles. And the, um, those, those individuals don't live as long and, and they, they're, they're unhealthy. They're not mentally stimulated. They, um, they, um, they do exactly the opposite of, of what I intend to do. And so I am fortunate enough that I, I, I have a number of friends that I've had since, um, um, you know, when I was six, seven, eight years old, high school, et cetera. Um, at the peak of my busyness professionally, I wasn't doing a very good job of, of staying engaged with those, with those individuals. And we would talk extremely infrequently um, over the course of the last couple of years, really, um, after hearing that and, and, and just missing them, um, I, I've, I've worked to become more engaged with those individuals. And so what I'm going to write in my time capsule is to continue to be socially engaged uh, going forward, not only with my lifelong friends, but also um, seek out new people to meet 
um, kind of the um, a, a little secret about me is I am a closet introvert. Um, so I'm clearly in the wrong industry, um, <laughs> but uh, but uh, but I, I oftentimes uh, don't put forth as much effort to meet new people and learn about new people as I would like to. And so as I uh, as I go through the next decade, I, I want to stay engaged with the people that I know. I want to meet new people. And I want to continue to um, to find new hobbies and new pursuits and new things to learn about. I I love 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 learning about things. I have been engrossed for the last four weeks in the Pacific Theater of Operations in World War II, and I am like deep in the trenches for it. I'm watching the Pacific. I'm listening to a an excellent hardcore history podcast mm. on the uh, the rise of the Japanese Empire. And I'm reading a book on the side that are all kind of going in tandem. So I'm getting a, a heavy dose of uh, of uh, the war in the Pacific. And I, I hope that I can continue to find uh, things that I don't know very much about now that I, I have an opportunity to, to immerse myself in and continue to be interested in learning um, as we go forward. So that's a long See, note, though. I think I just wrote like a five-page uh, instructions for myself. Hey, we'll, for, we'll, for we'll crumble years. it up real nice and, and tight, and we'll get it in there, man. We're going to need care. a bigger capsule. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I love what you said. One of the chapters in Sammy and my book um, is on lifelong learning, and yeah. that should be one of the focus areas, be intentional about what you're learning. And I can tell you, Steve, I learned a lot just through this conversation, and we could go on for probably – three more hours easily and still not run out of things to talk about. So we'll do that in person over two. drinks or on the boat <laughs> part two, yep. but this is the part where it's always my favorite part of the show. And so this is where Sammy and I, we do our best to narrow down everything we talked about and we share three things back to you that we're taking away from this conversation. And so we typically end up stealing from each other. Mm -hmm. I tend to, I feel like I've probably stolen more from Sammy over the years. So I, I, lately I've been letting him go first. So Sammy, I'll let you lead off and we'll ping pong back and forth. I, I think the last time we did this, I think I stole two of yours and I was trying to hit that third one, but I, I yeah, stuck that's out on the last one. You didn't. Yeah, I, I, was, I was shifty. Right. Always the strategist. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so it's really hard whenever you have like, one chicken scratch, but a ton of a ton of great notes and great feedback. Um, one of the things that that you mentioned there it kind of came towards the end of the conversation, um, but it's something that I've struggled with my in my life. But something that I try and get better at. And Greg's called me out on this for for years. But that practicing saying no to others and yourself, um, mm -hmm. especially when you're when your plate is full, because you can. I mean, I will be the first to admit. I have said this before. There's that old saying about eating an elephant. Like, how do you do that one bite at a time? Well, I have been guilty of trying to eat two elephants with one bite. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so it's a practicing saying no to others and yourself. Um, and the, and the thing is, is, um, spending that time to reflect on that as well. That's, that's something that was a really key takeaway for me. And I think for a lot of people. It really hit me when you were talking about your business, Steve, and you said, we are the enemies of good enough. Mm. Man, I just love that. And I think in our world, we, we, we find people oftentimes where they aren't invested in their work is sloppy and lazy. Or on the other hand, you get people that are so perfectionist driven that it causes them to have errors on the other side. But it's really that pursuit of excellence and realizing that good enough isn't going to cut it. Let's be excellent at what we do. And I've got a couple of sayings that I use that I write down on my legal pad every day um, before I start listing out kind of all the things that I'm going to accomplish that day. I'm going to start using that statement. I really, really love that. Awesome. Your Greg, spire ball caps on the way, Greg. Greg you, you, you stole it. You stole one of mine. So uh, kudos to you. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I love the fact that, and, and this isn't something like a direct action or something, but it's something that you mentioned that I gleaned from the conversation is that really you've showcased your leadership. You and Kimberly and the leadership at Spire have showcased that building a great culture allows for great teams and great work, but it's not just that surface level culture, the ping pong tables, the happy hours and all that that's needed. That's part of it, but also allowing for that room and that space, um, to work as a team, to hold each other accountable. I think that's that's a key point. And I love the fact that you you say we're a team, not a family, because mm -hmm. I think that's what's missing in a lot of uh, 
uh, companies right now as well. So kudos to your team and, and it shows the work is amazing. Thank you. Sammy, I had that circled as well. So kudos one to, to you one. for taking one, one to one. Here we go. Um, Sammy, I'll be interested. I, I know you probably wrote this down, but I'd be interested if you're going to take the angle that I did. But when you were talking about storm chasing, you mentioned one of the things that you feel like you have, may, I'm putting words in your mouth, but maybe a gift is to be somewhere if something does happen to be able to manage a situation. And I love the fact that you view yourself as a person who is capable of doing that. And I think that just goes to the heart of what the pursuit of growth is all about. It's all about, hey, how can we become and continuously strive to be the best versions of ourselves, and to be a person that in any different circumstance can step up, whether it's to manage a situation or be helpful, not panic, not run the other way in the side of adversity, but to be willing to say, hey, I'm going to put myself in a circumstance where I can help. That just really just stood out to me. And I appreciate you saying that. And it just kind of made me think. What am I continuing to do really in my personal growth to ensure that I'm the type of person that is able to manage a situation when those things happen? That's awesome. I wish I could have said that half as eloquently as you just did, Greg. Well, <laughs> so, I, 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 thanks I, I for taking my for, thought and, and, and expressing it so beautifully. Well, I, I practiced for about an hour in the bathroom before we, we hopped <laughs> on the air. I already had that written out. So. <laughs> Yeah, I actually had stars next to that, as you can see, right here and okay. here. Um, okay. It was, it was, I had be there when needed and be helpful. I mean, that was, that was yeah. kind of the way I took it too. So, but that doesn't count. That's not the one I'm going to say. So the last one I wanted to leave on was, it was something that you led with the very start of the conversation. And I think we tied this all together through the greatness of our interviewing skills, obviously. Um, Clearly. But the, uh, <laughs> the fact that, over the course of your life, you've made many mistakes and you've, and you've learned many lessons and that you kind of just said that when you were kind of talking a little bit about like how you got to where you are now, but it's, it's loops back full circle. I think in the fact the very end, when we're talking about the openness that you have now, your, your willingness to talk a little bit more about, yeah, um, and mental health, you know, and that kind of stuff and being open about not holding it in. The fact that you can admit to the many mistakes is shows also that you're continuously working on that. But again, it hopefully, and I think it will help the audience and other people who may be at us at a point in their life that need to hear that. will hear that and understand that we're all in this together. We're all facing some of the same issues. Um, and I hope that they're able to find that that advice is going to help them better their lives as well. So I'm going to do something a little bit different, but I'm actually going to take something that Sammy said um, that actually directly correlates and applies to Steve. And so when we started this conversation and Sammy introduced you, he mentioned that you were a friend and a mentor, somebody that he could go to for questions, you know, ask for advice, just have conversations. And, you know, even going back to what you said, Steve, about being socially engaged, find people in your life that can serve as your mentors and find people in your life that you can mentor. And I think when you do that, you just surround yourself with the right tribe of people that are just going to help you to feel you, that you're going to be able to play a role in their lives. And I just think that's so cool that you guys have that relationship. And, and Steve, I can see why, just through this conversation, why Sammy's had such great things to say about you. And I can absolutely see, I'm sure, the impact that the conversations you guys have sharing, obviously, very similar uh, roles in the, the careers that you've had, but also in just the people that you are, your hobbies and experiences, everything else. Been really cool, and so I'm I'm excited now, Steve, to consider you a friend, and uh, I'm excited to uh, to take the sailboat out with you in February. Yeah, absolutely. I I um I am excited to to call you a friend as well, Greg and and, and Sammy for all of the uh, the accolades that you sent my direction. Um, it, it goes equally back for you. I feel the same way about you. And and um, at the end of the day, human beings are not meant to go through life alone. Uh, we are a uh, we are social creatures and, and the more we can surround ourselves with with positive influences and positive people around us the uh, the, the more successful we're going to get um, making it through our lives i can't think of a better way to end that so thank you for that statement and that's going to be on the uh, the show notes as well so with that it's time for us to to have the the shameless plug um, portion so we allow you to let people Number one, know how to find you, find your company, or is there anything you want to promote 
any anything you want to share with the audience? Yeah, we're going to continue with um, with what we were talking about earlier. Well, first of all, if you want to find me, um, you can find me on through our website, spireagency.com. But what I really want to go is let's go back and, and, and touch on mental health one more time um, today. And, and, you know, obviously your audience is going to be watching this at, at different times going forward. But but we're moving into the holiday season. Today's December the 1st. Um, and this, in a lot of ways, is um, is usually the happiest time of year for for people and for families but oftentimes it's the most difficult time of year and um i would encourage everybody um especially this month but also just as you go through your lives love your family but also keep an eye out for other people that need to be loved um this is a um this is a very joyous happy time of year but there's also a lot of people who are lonely and they especially feel it over the course of the next four or five weeks and so my shameless plug for all of us would be um to um to spend that time and to, uh, to appreciate and to love your family, but also look for the other people who, who might be overlooked that, um, that exist kind of in the periphery of your life that, uh, that might need love this time of year as well and, and give yourself to them. Could not have said it better myself, Steve. Thank you. This was such a fun conversation. I think this was a, it a was. impactful conversation and there's already several people that I'm going to send this to specifically and bookmark some of the topics we talked about and said, hey, I think watching this right now is gonna be something that may provide you a little bit of, of, of direction or maybe a little bit of support. And so I can already tell you this conversation I think is gonna help people, myself included. Um, but with that, Sammy, you wanna tell everybody how they can get a hold of us online and maybe do our shameless plug of our book? Yeah, let's do that shameless plug. So you can find out about The Pursuit of Growth at thepursuitofgrowth.com or Live TPG on most social media channels, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, gosh, what else? YouTube, where the show is hosted. Yeah, um, LinkedIn. And LinkedIn as well. And coming up soon here in the new year, we are actually launching our brand new Facebook community in which we are wrap, we're rounding up all like-minded individuals that want to take part in a group of support and helping each other as we go through this life. So speaking directly to, to Steve, what you just mentioned was we are rounding up people that just want to help other people that want to be part of the community, share successes, goals, challenges, struggles, and how we can all support each other as we go along. So if that's something that interests you, go to our website, sign up for our newsletter. You'll get some more details about that. You can also go there and buy a copy of our book, The Pursuit of Growth. Shameless and plug. Shameless plug right here. Got it with me all the time. And uh, we hope that maybe even during this holiday time, if you find uh, the gift that, you know, a gift for somebody that has everything, maybe they can use a little bit of extra uh, reading time to themselves. So maybe you can send them a book for us. So with that, Greg, that's all I had for this evening. Steve, as always, it's a pleasure. I think we have already committed to seeing each other before the holidays roll around. Uh, and then Greg, why don't you take us home? Yeah. Well, guys, like always, live the best version of yourself. What Steve said, we're better together than we are by ourselves. And live the pursuit of growth. Peace.